The story of Iberia Flight 1456 is a strange one. It's unsettling. It ends with two pilots battling for control of their deranged jet in what could very well be the final seconds of their lives. But to understand how the story even got there, we have to start even before takeoff. The story of Flight 1456 began on a cold winter's night in the year 2001. 136 passengers boarded the brand new Airbus A320 at the gate in Barcelona. They were bound for Bilbao in the north of Spain, just under an hour away. There were four flight attendants on board. Up front in the cockpit, readying the aircraft for departure, were three pilots. 136 passengers, four flight attendants, and three pilots. 143 occupants in total. Except there was, in a sense, someone else on board. Humming away in the dark space beneath the cockpit was the 144th occupant, the computerized brain of the Airbus A320. Even nowadays, but certainly in 2001, the Airbus A320 was a state-of-the-art aircraft. It could have jumped straight out of the screen of a science fiction movie. A special feature of the aircraft is its fly-by-wire technology. On a traditional aircraft like the Boeing 737, when the pilots move their control columns, they're pulling on physical cables, which are directly connected to the flight control surfaces on the wings and the tailplane. On the Airbus A320, no such cables exist. Rather, when pilots move their side sticks, electrical signals are sent to no less than five onboard computers, whose outputs are then fed to actuators in the wings and tailplane, which move the control surfaces. This is known as fly-by-wire, because electrical wiring, and not cables and pulleys, move the flight controls. A key advantage of fly-by-wire is that every movement that the pilots make on their side sticks is checked by the computers to ensure that it is within safe limits. The computers do not let the pilots put their aircraft into a position which could cause a loss of control. Specifically, they protect against aerodynamic stall, overspeed, excessive bank, and excessive g-forces. Or at least, that's the idea. When the Airbus A320 first entered passenger service in 1988, its automation philosophy was met with a mixed response from pilots. Some thought that the computer's ability to prevent pilots from carrying out certain actions was overly restrictive and reduced flight safety. If you've used Netflix or any other streaming service, you're probably familiar with being restricted from accessing certain shows because of where you live. That's where today's sponsor, NordVPN, comes in. NordVPN allows you to access content that is normally blocked in your country by securely logging you in from one of over 5,000 servers around the world. You might have gotten the impression from watching this channel that airports are dangerous places, but while the chances of you being in a plane crash are pretty low, the chances of your data being stolen while you surf the web at the airport are quite a bit higher. NordVPN protects against that by securing your data with its inbuilt encryption, which allows you to browse safely wherever you are, be it at an airport or a cafe or an airport cafe. NordVPN also improves your browsing experience online by acting as an ad blocker, so you get to view websites without being bombarded with advertisements. If any of this sounds appealing to you, you can click on the link in the description below and use my coupon code green dot. By going to nordvpn.com forward slash green dot, you'll get a special deal and a 30 day money back guarantee. So click on that link in the description and make sure you use the coupon code green dot to avail of this special offer. On this fateful night in the cold February winter, as flight 624 pushed back from the gate, you might think that these added layers of computerized protection would come as a reassurance to the pilots. Indeed, they probably did. After all, the man sitting in the right-hand seat was a 24-year-old new hire with Iberia. He had just over 400 hours of flying time on the Airbus A320, which meant that this would be one of his first flights carrying passengers. He would be flying the aircraft to Babao on this night. In the left-hand seat, supervising him, was a well-seasoned 42-year-old captain with more than 10,000 hours of flying experience. He would be advising the new pilot and ensuring that he was performing at a standard where, after a few more flights, he would be able to fly passengers without supervision. Sitting behind the pilots in the jump seat was a 27-year-old first officer. He had over 2,500 hours of flying experience, and he would be acting as safety pilot for this flight. It was his job to keep an eye on the wider picture of what was going on on the flight, while the captain's attention was focused on the trainee pilot. At 1 minute past 9 that night, the pilots brought their aircraft into the skies above Barcelona, and headed east over the Spanish mainland. What the crew didn't know, and what none of the passengers could have known, was that as they settled in for their night flight to Bilbao, the computerized brain of the A320 was hiding a critical weakness. 
This weakness was a kind of electronic aneurysm, which under the right conditions would burst and spell disaster for those on board. Of course, the pilots could not have known any of this. As this was a short flight, they were already busy preparing for the approach and landing at Bilbao while they climbed to their cruising altitude. Bilbao's airport, like the town itself, is nestled between towering mountains on three sides and bordered by the expansive sea on the fourth. On windy nights like this one, the powerful gale coming off the mountaintops curls and spins into vortices, which are known as mountain wave rotors. These are experienced as strong turbulence by aircraft passing through them. While little more than a nuisance during the descent phase of flight, on final approach and landing, the sideways moving portions of these rotors can give rise to a highly dangerous phenomenon known as wind shear. Wind shear is a rapid change in wind speed or direction over a short distance. It's a critical danger to aircraft on final approach, because if that wind comes from behind the aircraft, it can bring its airspeed below stall, causing it to fall out of the sky. On top of this, the vertical components of rotors can cause an aircraft to climb or descend rapidly while it flies through them. Given the conditions on this night, the pilots of Flight 1456 would need to be ready to go around at any moment during the approach. This would no doubt have been daunting to the trainee pilot sitting in the right-hand seat. He would be landing an aircraft with over 100 passengers at night in gusty conditions where a go-around was a distinct possibility, and he would be doing this under the supervision of a senior captain and another pilot sitting behind him. He could have had no idea as the aircraft raced towards Bilbao that night that the weather would conspire with the aircraft's flight control computers in a completely novel and unforeseen way with serious consequences. Before we go into what happened on this approach, it's worth having a look at how the Airbus fly-by-wire system works. Unlike on Boeing aircraft, where the two pilots' controls are mechanically linked and thus move in tandem, on an Airbus, the lack of a mechanical link means that the side sticks can be moved independently of one another. This means that it's possible for the two pilots to make different inputs on the controls at the same time. Of course, this should never happen, as only one pilot should be flying at any given moment. So, when Airbus was designing this system, they included a button on each side stick, which a pilot can press to take over from the other pilot. Whoever presses this button last is in control of the plane. If neither pilot presses the button, and both are moving their side sticks, there is an arrow warning in the cockpit. Dual input. Dual input. When both pilots are making inputs on the controls, the flight computer simply adds these inputs together. So, if one pilot pulls back on the side stick, trying to bring the nose of the aircraft up, and the other pilot pushes forwards on the side stick, trying to push the nose of the aircraft down, these movements cancel out, and the aircraft maintains its vertical pitch. By the same logic, if both pilots pull back on their side sticks to bring the nose up, these movements are added together, and the nose of the aircraft rises faster than normal. If you want to understand what happened as Flight 1456 neared the runway this night, you should keep this logic in mind. A moment ago I talked about wind shear, and the dangerous effect that it can have on an aircraft which is travelling slowly on final approach. It's worth going into a bit more detail on this to understand the conditions that this flight experienced as it neared Bilbao. Put simply, an aircraft flies because there is a smooth flow of air moving over the wings. As long as this air is moving fast enough, smoothly over the wing, the plane stays in the air. As well as being fast, it's important that this air is attached to the top surface of the wing as it flows over it. That is, that the air conforms to the shape of the wing as it passes over it. This ensures that the wing creates lift, which is the force that keeps it in the air. One way for the airflow to become detached from the surface of the wing is if the air starts to hit the wing from an angle which is too far from straight on. This causes what is known as turbulent airflow on the upper surface of the wing, and it destroys the wing's ability to make lift, causing the plane to fall out of the sky. The angle at which the airflow hits the wing is known as the angle of attack. If the plane pitches up to an angle where the airflow over it detaches, or if the airflow itself changes direction such that this angle is reached, the aircraft experiences an aerodynamic stall and falls from the sky. The angle at which the airflow becomes detached is known as the critical angle. Given how important this angle is for safe flying, there needs to be some way for the aircraft to alert pilots to when they are approaching the critical angle of attack. To achieve this, the Airbus A320, like all passenger aircraft, has three angle of attack sensors located on the fuselage. These are like weather vanes, which detect the angle of oncoming air and warn the pilots if they are approaching the critical angle. Naturally, the correct response to this by the pilots is to reduce the angle at which the airflow hits the wings, so that air can flow smoothly over them again. 
They do this, quite simply, by pitching the nose of the aircraft down. Now, here's where the computerized magic of the Airbus A320 comes in. Because the A320 is fly-by-wire, it can prevent the pilots from exceeding the critical angle of attack. Even if the pilots want to stall the aircraft, the computer won't let them. It will allow them to pitch the nose up just to a point below the critical angle, but no further than that. In Airbus aircraft, this is known, naturally enough, as the angle of attack protection. So, we've covered the weather on this night, we've covered some aerodynamics, and we've covered a component of the A320's flight envelope protections, namely, the angle of attack protection. Let's go back to the flight now to see how these three puzzle pieces will join together as the aircraft nears Bilbao. Not long after reaching their cruising altitude, the pilots began their descent into Bilbao. They briefed for an arrival into runway 30, which would involve them approaching from the south and flying an instrument landing system, or ILS approach, down to the runway. While the visibility was good for the most part, the turbulent conditions that Bilbao is known for were in full force on this night. These unpredictable winds had made Bilbao infamous among pilots. In fact, just in the previous 15 days, there had been two weather-related accidents at the airport, including one aircraft that went off the end of the runway after attempting to land. In the previous five months, there had been a further three incidents. The airport was not equipped with modern weather measuring equipment or modern wind shear detectors, and as a result of this, pilots flying into Bilbao were often left in the dark and could only find out what the weather was truly like by flying into it. A few hours before Flight 1456 began its approach, three aircraft aborted their approaches to Bilbao and diverted to their alternate airports. A further three aircraft didn't even try to land at Bilbao, but simply diverted straight away. And yet, here was this flight, flown by pilot in training, attempting to land at Bilbao. As the pilots of Flight 1456 made their descent towards the airport, they were being thrown about by strong turbulence. This surprised them, as the weather reports they had received minutes earlier indicated that the winds were light. However, the Iberia Company Manual had warned them that when the wind was coming from the south or southwest, which it was on this night, they should expect wind shear and turbulence. It also said that no flight should be conducted into Bilbao if the wind was higher than 20 knots at the airport. The crew were just within the limits with respect to these two variables. As they descended below 6,000 feet, still 20 miles from the runway, the winds blew as fast as 55 knots, or 100 kilometers per hour. These gusts of headwind were so strong, in fact, that the overspeed warning sounded in the cockpit on several occasions. These unpredictable conditions were the reason that a number of other flights in front of this aircraft had aborted their approaches or diverted. The approach to runway 30 at Bilbao was even more challenging because the glide slope was steeper than a typical glide slope. This was because of the high terrain on the approach, which required aircraft to descend more steeply than they would on a typical approach. This meant that the pilots had to descend faster and be more vigilant that they had their airspeed under control, something which the gusty conditions made even more difficult. At 400 feet above the ground, the pilots disconnected the autopilot and began flying manually towards the runway. The dual input warning sounded several times, indicating that both the captain and trainee pilot were making inputs on their side sticks. Neither pilot pressed the takeover button on their side stick or issued the customary call out, I have control. Things were now about to happen very quickly. As the aircraft approached the runway, it experienced a series of rapid changes in wind speed and direction. At 200 feet above the ground, there was a tailwind. Then, passing through 100 feet, there was a vertical updraft, followed by a sudden downdraft, and then another strong updraft. In order to keep the aircraft on the glide slope during the updraft, the co-pilot pushed his side stick forward. However, the aircraft then immediately entered a downdraft, pushing the plane down towards the runway. In response to this, both pilots simultaneously pulled back on their side sticks. Terrifyingly, the plane didn't respond. The captain pushed the thrust levers fully forward in an attempt to abort the landing, but it was too late. The plane smashed into the tarmac nose first. The nose gear collapsed instantly, and the pilots tried to bring the nose back into the air as the main gear began skidding along into the ground. As the speed of the aircraft decreased, the pilots could no longer hold the nose in the air, and it fell back to the runway. Now the aircraft was scraping along the tarmac on its nose and engines, sending sparks and smoke into the air. Without the nose gear, the plane began to slide sideways, and the main tyres burst. Finally, 
After a screeching journey down the runway, the plane skidded to a stop. The captain shut down the engines and immediately ordered an evacuation. All 136 passengers survived, although 25 people were injured, one seriously. Seven of the injured passengers were taken to hospital for treatment. The aircraft itself was damaged beyond repair and was written off. This was an extremely close call. To give a sense of how hard the impact onto the runway was, there are Boeing 737s which have broken apart from less heavy impacts than this, and MD-11s which have broken apart from much lighter impacts than this. Many passengers on board the flight owe their lives simply to the sturdiness of the aircraft they happened to be travelling on. The pilots, for their part, were stunned. How had their aircraft simply ignored their commands in that crucial moment before touchdown? When investigators interviewed the pilots shortly after the accident, they were incredulous at first. Here was a flight crew, one of which was a trainee pilot, who flew into a notoriously difficult airport in gusty conditions at night when numerous aircraft had decided to divert before them, and they were claiming that rather than simply botching their landing, their state-of-the-art aircraft had ignored their control inputs. Both pilots insisted that just before impacting the runway, they had pulled back on their side sticks, and that the plane hadn't responded. In fact, they said that its nose dropped even further. Investigators then turned to the black boxes for answers. What they found baffled them. By examining the flight data recorder, they discovered that when the pilots both pulled back on their side sticks, the aircraft had indeed ignored their inputs. The A320 had been flying safely for years. How could this have happened, and were passengers around the world at risk of something similar happening again? As it turned out, a unique feature of a recent software update to the A320 was to blame. When both pilots pulled back on their side sticks, the computer calculated that the combined effect of their control inputs would put the plane in a nose-up condition which exceeded the critical angle of attack, and would likely stall the aircraft. As a result, the computer simply ignored these commands and did nothing. In fact, at the very moment that the pilots pulled back on their side sticks, the aircraft entered a tailwind. This reduced its airspeed, which the computers responded to by pushing the nose down further, slamming it into the runway. It was clear, poorly thought out software had caused this aircraft to crash. When the preliminary results of the investigation were released, Airbus immediately modified the software governing the aircraft during this critical phase of flight and incorporated this change into all A319s, A320s and A321s by the end of the following year. Now, the flight control computers give pilots significantly more authority close to the runway, and the angle of attack protections are not triggered nearly as easily. The final report into this accident was written up by the Spanish Civil Aviation Accident and Incident Investigation Authority, and it contained a number of recommendations aimed at preventing similar occurrences in future. These included that the Spanish National Meteorological Institute carry out research to improve the knowledge of the development of turbulence, gusts and wind shear around Bilbao, and to use this information to improve operations at the airport during the approach phase. Investigators determined that if just one of the pilots had been pulling back on their side stick, rather than both pilots, the nose-up command fed into the computers would not have been great enough to trigger the aircraft's angle of attack protection. This would have allowed the aircraft to go around, avoiding an accident altogether. As a result of this, the final report also recommended that Iberia improve their instruction of their A320 pilots to avoid the simultaneous activation of the side stick by both pilots without pushing the override button. They also recommended that Iberia restrict pilots flying under supervision from carrying out certain challenging approaches in poor weather. These changes have since been implemented, and there has not been a repeat of this kind of incident since 2001. Special thanks to the Patreon and YouTube members for supporting the channel. I'd especially like to thank Snowdoggo, Joey and Max Sal for their very generous contributions. If you'd like to see more of these kinds of videos and get some exclusive perks, then you can sign up on Patreon or YouTube. It really helps the channel out. I'd also like to pay a special thanks this episode to Hans Bose and Steve Uniaki, I hope I'm saying that right Steve, for helping me understand the Airbus systems which I described in the video. Finally, I'd also like to thank NordVPN again for sponsoring this video. As always, let me know if there are any incidents you'd like me to cover, and I'll see you next week for another episode.